Oh, look, a ladder. <laughs> we, uh, we use a lot of ladders this time of year, don't we? Sometimes we really don't like to, but climbing out there and getting up, putting uh, lights on the eave spouts and all that good stuff. Just did that a couple weeks ago myself, and it's become a tradition for our three boys under the age of 12 and I to get all the strands of Christmas lights and watch Dad get up and make a fool of himself, I'll almost fall off the ladder. And regard, every year, the same thing happens. One of our boys makes some quote or comment about Ch Chevy Chase's National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. You know that movie? Where Chevy's up on the ladder and he falls off. Don't fall, Dad! And da da da. And something, I think they're secretly waiting for me to fall, but um, we do that and have a lot of fun. I think of the scene in that movie where Chevy puts the ladder up against the house and he starts climbing up it and then it just suddenly goes down he goes all the way to the ground looks around and nobody saw him right and then puts it back up I just feel like I don't know about you but I feel like that sometimes in life where I feel like I'm putting the ladder up and starting to make progress on something and then all of a sudden back to square one I mean that's reality right ladder is a good symbolism for us we think about climbing the ladder of success uh, at your jobs and in life, where are you, how much money are you making, what rung are you on, are you in management, are you a worker, where is she at, where is he at, we think about all these things constantly, it's, it's all just embedded in our, in our uh, ideology of the, the way we look at the world. I think the trap for us is when it comes to our faith to think about the same type of thing, to apply the same principles. If we could just be good people or uh, do more acts of kindness or something that we can work our way up to God and God will somehow love us more. But anything can be further from the truth. I'm reminded of a, a uh, conference I went to recently in Chicago for large church pastors. And one of the speakers there who was a pastor told this story, true story. He found himself on an airplane. Uh, next to him seated there was a guy, uh, they, the airline put next to him, who didn't have, never went to church, was never organized religious part of his life. He believed in God, and oh, for this low, poorly man when he found out that he was sitting next to a pastor, right? It's like, ugh. But he got the courage about an hour into the flight to ask this pastor, who was our, our speaker at the conference, hey, you know, what is, what is this business with us and humanity and God? Because I feel like I'm a good person, and it doesn't matter what religion you belong to or, or whether or not you go to church. Just at the end of your life, God will see that you're a good person and he'll judge you like that. What do you think about that, Pastor? And he said, well, let me think of it this way. And he grabbed a, a cocktail napkin from the, the seat back in front of him and a pencil. And he drew a picture of a ladder. And he said, let's think about it this way. Let's test out that theory of your, your righteousness. So the most, what's the most moral uh, being that we could think of on this earth and he sketched down the word God who's holy and pure right so I've got God here I'll put it on the ladder this is the stunt portion of the sermon so hang on for those of you hoping I will fall shame on you Wonderful to see something exciting tonight. Well, so he put, God, he put God on the top, holy and most righteous. And then the pastor on the airplane said, let's put somebody on the bottom, the worst person you could think of, Adolf Hitler or, or a terrorist or a rapist or a murderer or whatever, just the dredges society will put near the bottom ladder. Now, he asked the person next to him, think of the most righteous person you could think of, either living or dead, anywhere in the world today or in the past. And the guy said, well, what about Mother Teresa? The pastor said, it's a great example. So he uh, took out his pen and he wrote down Mother Teresa about the middle of the ladder. We'll put it here just uh, so you can see it. Maybe about the middle of the ladder. And the pastor said, that's a good example. Mother Teresa, very, very fine woman, uh, was a Catholic nun who gave herself to uh, work in the slums of India and serve the poorest of the poor, giving them food and shelter. And sometimes Jesus and Mother Teresa who won 125 humanitarian awards I think it was even sainted in the Catholic Church for her work she's famously said I am not good enough to earn the kingdom of heaven there's nothing I've done in my life that earns me righteousness with God everywhere we go Jesus goes ahead of us we can't do anything with it without him we can do everything with him 
pastor then said to the person on the airplane, now who is the most righteous person, the best person you could think of in the United States, living or dead? The guy said, well, how about Billy Graham? Good. So he scribbles down Billy Graham, puts it right down below Mother Teresa, and says, uh, Billy Graham is a great example. This pastor at the conference said, I've, I prayed with Billy Graham. I've met with him. He's prayed for me and my family. Great example for us. And yet, Billy Graham has famously said, I am not worthy of the kingdom of God. None of the sermons I've given are committing people's lives to Christ in the billions has earned me anything enough to be considered righteous before God. Then the pastor, being a good pastor, he said, I'll put myself on this list to help you out. I'll put myself slightly below Billy Graham, and I would do the same. And then he slid the piece of paper over to the guy next to him on the plane and said, now you, if you think you're good enough for God, and you know this one, these aren't, where would you put yourself on this list? And think long and hard before you put yourself above Mother Teresa. <laughs> And the guy said, well, probably just below you, pastor. <laughs> Good call. So the pastor wrote, you just below the other examples. So the guy looks at this, and the pastor said, now what do you make of that? He said, well, I think we're in a world of hurt. I mean, if I can't, if Mother Teresa can't make it, and Billy Graham can't make it, and you can't make it a pastor, what hope do we have, the little people in life? What hope does anyone have? I mean, there's quite a conundrum. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, if you would work really, really hard at being a great person and doing a lot of good things for people, as much as you can, spent 24-7, you might climb a rung or two, but you're not going to close the gap between you and God. You can't do it. None of us can. It's a conundrum. But it's also one that God sees from God's perspective. He realizes that we, the sinful people, are separated from the Creator, the Creator and the creation. We've separated ourselves. And here's the good news, friends. God takes action on Christmas to make that right. Instead of having us climb up the ladder to unachievable to God, God, on this night, decides to become one of us, a human being. And he's a human mother and a human father, but at the same time, he's God in all of his righteousness and power and purity. And God decides to do something awesome. He descends down the ladder for us, not just for the saints like Mother Teresa, not just for the great preachers like Billy Graham or the righteous like other clergy, but he goes all the way down and takes his place below you. I think to emphasize this, God decides to be born a very, very extremely humble beginnings so that we understand that wealth and power and prestige and climbing the ladder is not what it's all about. God comes down and he comes down to serve, specifically to serve you who aren't worthy to make the climb. This is what God does for us in Jesus Christ. God, God's self, becomes born of a family in poverty who will be refugees, immigrants kicked out of their own country, who don't have a dollar to their name, can't even afford to stay anywhere if there was a place open, and they have to have their son in a barn. These are the great links that God is committed to come to you. Now here's the good news. I know that some of you don't really want to be here tonight, okay? It's a secret between me and you, okay? I know she wanted you to come or whatever and some of you are forced here against your will I was out looking at the parking lot I saw several pairs of heel prints you know on the way in you were drug here against your will okay <laughs> but you're here and I think there's a reason for it I was just like you for many many years people drug me to church I didn't want to have anything to do with organized religion until I eventually got this and then I realize I can't get enough of it because I want to come and say thank you to the God who has come down to my level, even below, so that I can be right with God. Amen. Friends, the climb is over. It's exhausting, amen? It's exhausting. 
And the good news is, you don't have to do it anymore. Stop climbing and fall back on the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He's there below you for a reason, so you can fall off and he will catch you. This is by design, by God. This is what happens at Christmas. And all of us who dare to believe in what God has done for us and fall back on him and are baptized into this Christ, something incredible happens. Our fates now become sealed. And it doesn't matter if you like church or not. It doesn't matter if you're a good person or not. Give it over to the one God who created us all and came to us all for the whole world, for all religions, in Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we give our hearts over to God in Christ. We're cemented with Him. And now His fate will be our fate. And our fate will be His fate. And we know that God just doesn't stay there at the lowest of the lows. He goes on to grow up to be a man who will go to the extreme lengths in His love for you to die on a cross. He will be separated from God. And the Apostles' Creed says He'll go down to the dead and to hell and rescue us all. But God doesn't leave Him there. God the Father raises His Son up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, your fate is His fate and His fate is your fate. And so something awesome happens here when Jesus is raised up by God His Father. He stops to pick up some people along the way. Namely you. And now when God the Father raises Jesus the Son, He doesn't go alone. But you miserable people come with Him. Why? Because God loves you. God knew you before you were a twinkle in your father's eye or in kicking in your mother's womb. God did what God did 2,000 years ago before you were even here because he believes in you that much. He loves you that much. He forgives you that much. And because now the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father, so are you. So are you. And this is good news, amen? This is the great news, amen? This is why we come on to the 24th and we sing, Hark the Herald, the angels sing! Glory to our newborn King, peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. The Creator and the creation, the gap has been closed. God closed it for now and forever. And we celebrate that tonight on Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone.